You, you have to forgive me. I know I can get through this talk, but you just have to be, uh, uh, you have to be patient with me. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about an idea that I've been thinking about for a long time uh, called the poorest city. And maybe I can explain it concretely in the following way. Uh, recently, I tried to buy an iPhone in Nehru Place an open-air electronics market in Delhi where goods that happen to have fallen off a truck are sold for 30%, 40%, or 70% discounts, whatever cash you have handy. My iPhone turned out to be a damaged dud, but they didn't really care. Um, the experience of going to Nehru Place was eye-opening. I'll show another picture of it. Um, it's a completely porous spot in the city. People of all castes, classes, races, and religions coming and going, doing deals and phones, or gossiping about the small tech startups in the low offices around the square. That's above. Uh, you can see on the second floors and above. Uh, you can also worship at a small shrine if you're so minded, or find a sari, or just lounge about drinking tea. Nehru Place is every urbanist's dream, intense, mixed, complex. Uh, if it's the sort of place we want to make, it's not, however, the sort of space most cities are building. Instead, the dominant forms of urban growth are monofunctional, like shopping centers where you are welcome to shop, but there's no place to pray. These sorts of places tend to be isolated in space, as in the office campuses built on the edge of cities, or towers in a city center, which, as in London's current crop of architectural monsters, I say no more, uh, are sealed off at the base from the surroundings. Can I remark? It's amazing to walk among these spaces. You can't get into any of them. They're all sealed. They're, bo they're glass boxes. You can look inside, but it's not for you. It's not just evil developers, however, who want things this way. The most popular form of residential housing worldwide is the gated community. Is it worth trying to turn the dream of the poorest city into a pervasive reality? I want, wondered in Nehru Place about the social side of this question. Since Indian cities have been swept from time to time by waves of ethnic and religious violence. Could porous places tamp down that threat by mixing people together in everyday activities? Evidence from Western cities answers both yes and no. In Dresden last year's Pegida demonstrations against the Muslim presence in Germany, for instance, uh, in that, Pegida argued that Muslim culture is alien to Western values. This argument was turned out to be made by people in Pegida who don't live anywhere near Muslims in the city, indeed who know no Muslims, so they're completely separated. The American social scientist Robert Putnam adds a seemingly contradictory, ironic twist to the separation in space of different social groups. In a study of several cities, his researchers found that the further away white Americans live from African Americans, <coughs> the more tolerant the whites are. That is, the closer you are, the more intolerant. So these are two contrary facts. 
They don't fit together. It's yes or no. Against this logic of separation stands Paris. The Islamist, Islamic banlieue of Paris are separated from the center by the centure, the ever-clogged ring road around the inner city. And so too in Brussels, Molenbeek district, from which many of the terrorists come. It's a disconnected island in the city. As the sociologist William Julius Wilson has shown, such physical islands breed inward -looking men an inward-looking mentality in which fantasy about others takes the place of facts bred of actual contact. As true, Wilson argues, of the black ghetto as it is of Christian Agita. Now I have to say about this that I'm deeply uncomfortable about debates over separation and inclusion, which move almost seamlessly to citing violent extreme behavior as evidence for or against. This is just wrong socially, which is why Nehru Place uh, is a better place to think about inclusion than Molenbeek. Every day, people are going about their business with others unlike themselves, people they don't know, perhaps people they don't like. There is what might be called the democracy of crime here, as Hindus and Muslims both sell illegal elect electronics. A wave of violence would clear off customers for both. Getting along in this, this kind of environment isn't particular to India or to open-air markets. Numerous studies show that in offices or factories that adults of different religions and races work perfectly well together, and the reason is not far to seek. And, and, oh, I, I want to explain this. I've just got to have more of this water. I know I'm going to get there. Uh, just bear with me for a second. Work is not about affirming your identity. It's about getting things done. The complexity of city life tends, in fact, to breed many identities for its citizens as workers, but also as spectators at sports events, as parents concerned about schooling or patients suffering from NHS cuts. Urban identities are porous in the sense that we are always going in and out of lots of different experiences in different places with people we don't know in the course of a single day. When pundits opine on the difficulty of difference, they flatten identity into a single image, just one experience. The modern economy can then flatten identity when it sells people on the idea of the gated homogeneous community as safe, which is not true in fact, um, or build shopping centers only for shopping or constructs office campuses and towers whose workers are sealed off from the city. So this is a problem for this. This is a debate about purified identity. It's not a debate which makes any sense about work, nor about forms of leisure, where the problem of difference and integration just doesn't arrive. It's, as Sukhaya says, it's a question about the meaning of home. And the meaning of home is synonymous with a kind of homogenizing of identity. You can see where I'm going. In order to make the city more tolerant, we should have a less strong identification with home. We should learn how to use the city and live in the city in a more impersonal way. It's why I've argued against the many, many 
projects that seek to strengthen community. That's a way of strengthening and flattening home. We belong here, even if the we is very many different people. It's still saying this is a particular place and this is with the place with which I identify. Now, I want to just say for a bit, I, I hope I haven't talked too long. Uh, that You're if, fine, Richard. Okay, if the public comes to demand it, urbanists can easily design a porous city on the model of Nehru Place. And indeed, many of the architects and planners at the Urban Age events now unfolding in London have made proposals to porosify the city. I'm just going to show you very briefly what that means. Threatening this technology. Porosity, it is. I'm over 60. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you have to be under 50 to really feel this. Uh, the first aspect about porosity is that it deals with edges. And edges come in two forms borders and boundaries. That happens in nature. The work I did with some of my students at MIT. The cell membrane is a border. It's porous, but it has, uh, whereas a, a cell wall uh, 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 is not so porous. The thing about this is that porosity is just not free flowing. A cell membrane is both porous and resistant. It tries to keep in the valuable ingredients in the cell and to exchange ingredients it doesn't need. The problem with the cell wall, as in the cellulose fibers that we looked at, is that no exchange is possible. So when we talk about porosity, we're not talking about openness in the sense that anything flows everywhere. We're talking about a very uh, complex condition in nature. The same thing is true about ecological borders. This uh, is another study we did in, uh, in uh, uh, Provincetown, which is just off Boston. The places of greatest activity here, uh, both biological and, eco and um, evolutionary, are where uh, the water meets uh, the land. Same thing about uh, the layers of water in, in the ocean itself. It's at the edge where the most activity goes on in, in a natural way. And a hedgerow, you'll all know this as a familiar example of, of something which is mixed in that way. And so it's very, um, uh, and so it's very alive, much more alive than the moan spaces around it. By contrast, this is my favorite slide of everything I showed. These are tiger dropping uh, border boundaries, and you know how they do it. They shit a a warning set of warning signals here that this is for my group. No other tigers are, ne are allowed. Indeed, no other animals uh, uh, who know how to read these signals are allowed. Anyhow, so this distinction between borders and boundaries is fundamental in the natural world. It's also something that we can build. This is a photo I took of the Israeli security wall, which is the ultimate built boundary on one side. That's on the Israeli side. I, I couldn't get across the other side. The Israelis wouldn't let me go. But on the other side of this is a market made by Palestinians where they sell all sorts of things. You know, the, uh, the, the wall in the morning offers them shade. And they have just this one little way to get through. But on the Israeli side, this is what I mean. This is a low intensity edge. It's a wall. Um, walls themselves uh, can be, uh, can function as borders. This is one in Avignon. This is where Jews, prostitutes, uh, and uh, Germans. What a company. 
information. <laughs> <laughs> All clustered. They weren't allowed in the city center. I make no more further comment on that. And as, as you've seen in, in, the, in Ricky Burnett's original presentation to you, this is uh, traffic is creating a border. Whereas this um, in Sao Paulo, remember this town this is what we took from the dizzying height, is a boundary. People can walk across this traffic. It's slow, whereas this is fast. And the edges are highly porous. You have to watch out because uh, you're in Brazil, which means that your life t is taken in your hands every time you get in the way of a bus. But it works as a border. This is, to me, the most uh, profound kind of distinction between borders and boundaries we know. That is between the vertical and the horizontal. Everything above the ground plane here is isolated from it. Everything. And this is a huge problem in the making of almost all tall buildings. How do you make them pour us up? We have some ideas about how to make them pour us at the ground plane by putting in lots of doors, uh, by getting rid of security codes to get into an elevator and so and so on. There are lots of ways to do it. But porosity is inachievable for us in almost all vertical dimensions. Now, uh, well, I don't want to talk about it. This is a project I did in East London. Another way of making something porous is by changing its function. And this is a parking lot project where it's a parking lot, but we pour tons of sand on it. So little kids are at the beach in this poor part of London. And to come back to this, this is a border in Mumbai. That is, lots of things happening both vertically and horizontally there. People are eating, their kids are upstairs whining or crying for mommy who can go from uh, ground floor up. It's also a space of production. And that's why I want to show you this. Uh, this is another kind of border in Mumbai. This is quite a frightening phenomenon. This is the work of, yeah. The school, for the, this is a block away from what I just showed you. The school for these kids crosses these train tracks. I don't know what your experience of Indian uh, uh, train schedules is. Mine, yours sounds like yours, very regular. Mine was that these are quite um, irregular. And these kids have to treat this as a dangerous, porous border to get to and from school, which they go back into day after day, uh, hour after hour during the day. So it develops kind of street smarts environmentally. Um, and finally, I'll just show you this. The opposition between a border and a boundary spatially is something that is a continuity. This is Bogota's version of Nehru Place. Uh, people here, they have a lot of things that have fallen off the back of the truck for sale. And they're selling them on overturned uh, uh, cardboard boxes. Uh, if they prosper, they move up a floor. And they're still dealing in semi-legal goods, but the floors are now organized like streets. And they have customers who come to where they're shopping. I suppose uh, um, uh, my sal the salesman on my iPhone has regulars to whom my iPhone wouldn't be sold. Anyhow, it's a, it's a cluster here. If you get up to the top, the top floor, they've actually built, they've taken four by eight sheets of cardboard and created miniature stores up there. What you're looking here is vertically rising from 
the poorest to the non-porous, from the informal to the formal. This is what physically social mobility looks like. You understand what I'm saying? This is, social mobility is not just a statistical fact. It's a physical experience. Uh, now, I, I've mostly showed you things from, uh, from non-Western countries. I'll just show you very quickly how uh, uh, one of my masters, Aldo van Eyck, dealt with the problem of porosity. This is a, this is a, um, a space in a Amsterdam with this huge, all this huge open traffic zone. What he did is he filled it in. And what's porous about this is that people barrel down this street and these little kids are playing at the edge. Like the kids in Mumbai, they have to learn the street smarts about where you go and where you don't go. That is, they have to become uh, visually uh, safe. Health and safety would have never allowed this in Britain mm -hmm. to be built. You have to segregate those kids away. You have to do the equivalent of shut them up in a boundary. Whereas the Van Eyck notion is they're learning the city by being at a border edge. Here's another one of these. This, this is a beautiful one. And they're everywhere. And, uh, and there are 700 of these he made, made in uh, Amsterdam. They're all places of porosity. And the notion is that a poor city is a way in which you learn your city. So what I'd like to say about this in sum is that if the public comes to demand it, we urbanists can design a porous city. Like Nehru Place, these, these other visions entail opening up and blurring the edges of spaces so that people are drawn in rather than repulsed. Uh, they're dangerous, they're ambiguous, they emphasize true mixed use of public and private functions. In, in British terms, schools or, or clinics amidst Tesco or Pret. They explore the making of loose-fitting spaces which can shift in shape as people's lives change. I don't believe that in design determinism, but I do believe that the physical environment should nurture the complexity of identity. That's an abstract way of saying that we know how to make a porous city. Uh, the time has come to make it. Thank you very much.